Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar brought to you by Kenanga Investment Bank in collaboration with Rakuten Trade and Bursa Malaysia. My name is Shen Chu. I'm the moderator for this webinar. Now, our webinar today is titled Banking Sector, Seasonal Trading or Resilient Investment. So we're going to explore this topic. Now, the banking sector was in the limelight but for all the wrong reasons early this year with the failures of the US, several US banks and uh, Credit Suisse. So far, the banking stocks have been able to regain the lost ground from the past sell-off thanks to a better domestic macros and also a better clarity post the state election. But with fears of recession still looming, should investors wait for a clearer market signal or downtrends before investing with all these banks? So today we're going to explore this issue and gain more insights into this sector. But before we begin, as usual, disclaimer, whatever we share in this session is only for educational purpose. So you're 100% responsible for all your investment risks. All right. Now today we are very honored to have invited the senior equity analyst of Kananga Investment Bank, Mr. Clement Chua to share with us his view on this banking sector, whether is it for seasonal trading or it is a resilient investment. So welcome, Clement, to our webinar today. How are you? I'm good, Shane. Um, so maybe if I could just um, start. <laughs> and sure. apologies to everybody because uh, I, I just, I'm still recovering a little bit from uh, influenza. So uh, there may be a bit of... Um, um, a twang in my voice. Um, hope you can bear with me for that. Uh, but hopefully uh, we can have a smooth and uh, productive session. Uh, yep. For this right. yeah. Just pace yourself. All right. Over to you. Okay. Yes. Hi. Hi, everybody. So thanks for your time um, this evening. Just give me a second to pop up my slides. Okay. Here we go. All right. So <clears throat> I think Shane... Uh, just um, he summarized it quite nicely. Um, there is a few hiccups with the banking sector that we're seeing recently. It's really not uh, reflective of um, where we have seen um, the banking stocks perform, at least even just looking at last year. Um, a lot of the things maybe we can attribute it to Malaysia not being good enough. Uh, we could just blame you know foreign influences uh, because of the for the U.S. banks and Credit Suisse as well failing. Um, but overall, it's just really the stock market. Um, we do react according to how sentiments uh, rile up the, um, the, <clears throat> the sector. And this is usually where some people might either see, is it an opportunity for us to collect more to bolster our portfolios? Or maybe it's time for us to maybe cut our losses and maybe revisit it. Um, sometime later on when, um, I guess as Shane also said, when things become clearer. Um, so I'll just maybe start by going a quick uh, run through with the key topics we'll be touching through today. Um, I usually like to do this. Um, we would just um, quickly go through where we stand with the banks right now, um, as well as uh, how the industry fundamentals are reading. And I guess the meat of today would be basically how I would think we should time our positions with the banking sector, um, at least for the time being. But I do think that some of the learnings here could maybe be carried on um, for future, um, for, for the future occurrences where we do think that the banking sector is a bit uncertain at the moment. Uh, and lastly, just a very quick one on the overall calls and recommendations that we have on, on our coverages on the banking sector. <clears throat> right, so um, I always start with this. I think it's always worth highlighting um, all the time. So why banks are important to your overall portfolio or even just to the stock market in general? Because uh, we do have uh, benchmark indexes. Um, this would be the KLCI, which is on the left. Um, if we want to see something that is a bit more sector-wide, um, we do have the PUSA Finance Index, or the used to call it the KL Fin Index. Basically, it's the index used um, to benchmark all of the financial institutions in the market. Uh, this would also include the non-bank um, lenders, like you can see ELK, DESA, uh, RCE Capital as well. 
Uh, but basically, the point of me showing this is that you know the banks they do have a very significant uh, influence to how the indexes perform. Uh, for the KLCI, they make up forty three percent of the total weightage, and for the Bursa Finance Index, they are essentially almost the whole thing. Um, it's eighty eight percent. Um, minusing off a few big names like the Hong Kong Financial Group and Brussels Malaysia. Um, but other than that, we can just safely say that this Brussels Finance Index is basically the, the banking index. And for this presentation, I would actually be using the KL Fin quite, um, quite a lot uh, because uh, it does help it, it does make it easier to explain uh, the sector's performance as a whole. Um, at, for this discussion. So maybe I would like to start with something I mentioned earlier is that um, the banks did do quite well. And this is the chart of um, the banking performances uh, for the calendar year of 2022. Um, starting off in the year, you can see that most of the banks, um, they did outperform the KLCI, which is the dotted line in red. Uh, with one exception being BMB, um, the KL Fin Index is um, somewhere in the middle, but you can probably agree that most of the banks, they did outperform um, the, the KLCI in quite a big way. And that is something that a lot of uh, investors do seek, uh, especially for the larger institutional investors. <laughs> but when we come to this year, it seems like everything has just flipped upside down. Basically, um, I think that's only about the two or three banks who were able to outperform the KLCI only very recently. But if you look somewhere towards the middle of the year where things basically started to collapse, uh, it all started in March, really. Uh, this, is the, this is where the um, failures of the, UX, the US banks started to happen. There was a very big dip over here. And I think the word that people were throwing around back then was um, contagion. And it's not the term that people would usually use outside of um, viral infections like COVID, uh, but it is something that people were worried about because the banking sector, the banking sector globally is quite complex. People do lend across to each other. Um, someone's failure could lead to a lot of cascading effects to you as well. And I think we're also seeing that with um, the China market, especially in the property sector, because if some of the developers, <coughs> excuse me, are not able to repay their loans and that would affect the financial system altogether. So I guess just to go back to the crux of it all, it's um, basically the collapse of the US banks. Um, I think most of us would have already been caught up with the news um, as to why this happened, but I think very briefly, I can just summarize it in, in one word, which is mismanagement. Um, how this happened was because uh, SVB Bank, uh, although they are not anywhere near the top 10 banks within the US, but they do have a very unique position um, where they are highly corporate driven. They do not have many um, retail accounts, uh, which would be you know, your normal general consumers. But at the same time, they also made um, some unfortunate bets. Um, I think we all know back then, um, in, in the good parts of um, 2022, um, interest rates everywhere was very, very low. Um, U.S. Fed rates were touching at the 0.25%. Um, even we ourselves were at 1.75. And when rates just kept rising, um, it does take a toll on your, <clears throat> excuse me, the values of your bonds, uh, which Silicon Valley Bank unfortunately did hold quite a lot in. And when the value of your investments fall, um, basically you do not have enough capital to support um, your own operations. Though. I mean, simply, simply speaking, they do not have enough money to meet any withdrawals. And um, this did cause concerns and it did trigger a bank run. And that was basically where everything just um, fall out of place. And I guess what's not helping as well is in the US banking system, which is very unlike Malaysia, they are very, they are not as regulated. They do like the freedom of it. Um, they think it does instill innovation and competitiveness in the market. But unfortunately, lower oversight does mean that you do expose certain organizations to greater risk um, such as this. 
And although a lot of the local banks do complain that Bank Negara has been very strict and very rigid in how they manage things over here in Malaysia, but I do think that uh, we have them to thank for because otherwise, you know, we may not, we may even be quite similar to where um, Silicon Valley Bank is at this moment. And touching on, on, the, other, on the other big one is Credit Suisse. Um, Credit Suisse isn't something that just happened overnight like Silicon Valley Bank. It is something that has been brewing for the past few years or so. And I think for those who may have been following this name, um, although they are one of the most globally systemic banks out there, but they are pretty much plagued in controversy. Um, there is a lot of scandals. Um, there is a lot of um, fears of mismanagement on their end as well. And I guess all it took was for one of the Saudi investors to just say that, no, they're not going to support the bank anymore for everything to just fall apart. Uh, but lucky for them, they do have um, UBS to come in to carry the burden of the bank. But otherwise, you know, having just seen these two big banks, um, well, actually there is more in the US, but uh, these two notable banks to just fall within a short period of time this year, it does send shockwaves to the banking sector. Um, we were not the only country that did see this. Um, I believe Singapore as well to some degree. Um, but basically it was not a good time for anyone who was holding um, banking stocks during that period. Um, well, I guess a bit something a bit further down the line, um, we are going to see this um, coming very soon. Um, in 20, <clears throat> 2021, uh, Bank Nagara did um, issue up the licenses for, sorry, 2022. Um, Bank Negara did issue up our digital banking licenses. Uh, we are expected to see these five, um, um, <clears throat> these five uh, groups to come up with their respective digital banks um, very soon. I believe the deadline is um, sometime within one to two Q next year. Um, but we have Grab's bank, uh, the GX bank, um, being the first to make an official uh, announcement as to their presence in the market. Um, we shall wait and see. Um, at this moment, I do not think there will be one other factor that would possibly press the banking sector too much because they are restricted by a lot of um, structural limitations as imposed by Bank Negara. Excuse me. Um, but it is exciting to see because <clears throat> This is something that um, we may be lacking in the sense that um, there are still underserved communities and underbanked communities in Malaysia, mainly in the rural markets. Um, this is one that could help serve these um, these um, potential clients. Um, being banked is a, it's technically an essentiality in you know in the current times. So we do not live. Uh, we are moving out of um, living in a cash society. Everything is starting to be cashless. And I think the conveniences that we are enjoying from it is quite strong. And, um, you know, basically just having the safety net of a savings account is also something that, um, you know, these uh, underserved markets uh, should be, you know, should try to benefit from. Right. So just to run through the industry fundamentals uh, at this moment, um, although we are seeing some minor hiccups here and there, overall, we can see that um, the industry loans growth, uh, which is the key driver of the banking sector, is still doing quite well. And probably for those who might have been looking on the more macro picture, uh, I think you would have seen that our 2Q23 GDP numbers uh, did not come in uh, as well as expected. And Probably what we can blame is uh, our weaker ringgit. Um, production has been coming off. Exports are also being damaged a little bit, um, not helping the economy whatsoever. But one thing that we can take comfort from here is that you know although the banking sector um, as a whole is seen to be a proxy to the economy, we are still in a way more stable and less volatile in, in this sense. Like. So why, why we are able to get this at this moment is because if you do look at the breakdown um, between the loans um, of, um, well, within the country, 
um, they would split it to two um, business loans and household loans. Um, that would be for your retailers and the other one being your corporates and your commercials. Basically, we are starting to see a disparity here, um, which is where basically, well, essentially it's mortgages. Uh, mortgages are the ones that are keeping household loans to be quite solid. And in the past, um, when the OPR was at its lowest at 1.75, uh, we have seen, or at least the banks have reported to say that there are a lot of um, housing purchases, which is quite contrary to the softening economy or even during, you know, the lockdown period that we've seen during COVID. But <clears throat> there are a lot of people swooping in to buy up um, sub-sale um, properties. But where we are now, even though the interest rates are now OPR is at 3%, there has been a move um, towards affordable housing instead. So uh, I guess this would probably be the likes of your condominiums because they are a bit more cash flow friendly to new homeowners. And even though you know we do think about the inflation being something that could help to suppress overall spending, excuse me, but the fact is um, people still do need housing. There is an oversupply uh, at this moment. Yes, it's true. Uh, but I think it only means that um, you know, consumers can afford to be selective. And that is uh, pretty much a win for the household um, loans. But on the business side, um, very much unfortunately, um, we can see that it's pretty much downhill from here. Um, the first OPR hike that we have seen did come in in May. And every two months after that until January where it paused for a bit and then came back again in May 23. It's just probably not helping um, the business environments to grow as well. Demand for loans to grow their working capital is um, being suppressed and well pretty much cash flow is just not being um, something that a lot of businesses can afford to grow at the moment and Although we do expect that maybe this would remain uh, at least for the next few months or so, I think the comfort that we can take here is we are still in an environment where the demand for loans are still there. There are businesses who can still afford to take up loans, who still need the financing. Maybe some businesses may not be able to be as well supported, but uh, it, it, we are still pretty much far away from a recessionary environment. And I think that is something that's uh, quite comforting uh, for us at this moment. All right, so just to reiterate the earlier point, I think, um, yeah, we did see the biggest component of um, household loans being residential properties. Surprisingly as well, um, we are seeing transport um, loans also picking up the higher purchases and Maybe we can say that um, you know there are more of more attractive launches coming up, and I think a lot of people have been attributing it to more EV launches out there. Um, but you know, it seems like Malaysians are still quite eager to spend, um, contrary to everything that else that we're seeing. So it's pretty good for us, um, or at least for the banks at this moment. Um, but of course, being tied down to a commitment, I don't think anyone would do that lightly if they cannot afford to do it. So just to give a broad picture of um, where the banks, or at least the local banks, the local listed banks are at this moment. Um, we can see this is, um, well, loans growth, uh, I should say. This is how well the local banks have been growing in terms of their loans, um, at least from 2019 uh, until the most recent June quarter over here. So we can see that most of the banks actually have been able to grow above um, the industry average, um, this red dotted line. But other, the other banks, the black dotted lines, uh, are actually coming to a point where they are experiencing almost negative growth. And these people, I would say, are your foreign banks. And just looking at the newspaper, I think even for those who own a Citibank card, uh, you would know what's happening. Um, a lot of the foreign bankers, they are they just do not think that maybe Malaysia is a place worth doing business in. They are leaving the country and um, passing on their assets to other players in the market. But essentially by doing so, 
um, you are funneling back uh, market share to you know, your strong local players out there. You know, you can see from here as well uh, what I mean by this. <clears throat> this bigger, the bigger part of the pie chart on the left here is the market share of the non-listed banks in 2Q22. It's stood at about 19.2%. Whereas in 2Q23, um, the recent June quarter, we are seeing it reduced by about 0.9%. And a lot of it did go across the players in the market. Um, although admittedly, we are seeing some competition within ourselves as well. Uh, this one, I think it's Maybank. Maybank is, um, they are the largest in the market, locally speaking still. 17.8, shedding off a little bit to 17.7. Um, the likes of um, this is CMB Bank also coming off a little bit. Whereas we see small banks like Hong Yong Bank uh, gaining some share from 8% to 8.2. Um, we also see M Bank from 6.1 to 6.3. Uh, it's really just a sign to show that you know, the local market at least is still quite vibrant. People are still proactively trying to solidify their position in the market. And I think that's also a good signal um, to the strength of our own local banking system. So yeah, mentioned about OPR a bit just now, but this is, um, I think, where uh, it's a bit more relevant. Why OPR was um, something that people need to consider at the first place is because it is a monetary tool that, <coughs> excuse me, that the central bank would use to control inflation. And coming off um, from the deflationary period that we had experienced during COVID lockdowns, which is right here, um, the moment where we do see some relaxation, that is where uh, I guess we also ex we will probably experience this firsthand as well. Things just got a bit too expensive too quickly. And it did show within the readings of the uh, Department of Statistics. And although a lot of us with those longer term commitments like um, housing loans, for example, we did enjoy the lower repayments during this period, but eventually we have to come back to normal somehow. Uh, in the past, before COVID, we did stay at 3% OPR. Uh, that, that's where we are today. And um, we do not believe that's going to be another hike, at least for this year. Uh, what's helping that as well is because we are able to at least bring inflation back to, I guess, where Bank Gara wants it to be, uh, which is 2% or lower. Uh, I believe we are not below 2% yet, but um, probably we show it and see where the 3Q numbers are. But it doesn't seem like there is a need for Bank Negara to further increase uh, our OPR. And I, I guess this picture is something that's very different if you look across to the US because the US Fed would just keep on pumping interest rates because the economy is just really stubborn with regards to inflation. And um, we are lucky enough to not be in that similar situation right now. So what happens when the OPR um, moves in effect. So for the banks, um, we do look at this thing called net interest margins or NIMS for short. In a state where your interest rates are low, you would probably think that, okay, maybe the banks are not charging as much and hence why they may not be earning so much as well. But the contrary to that is when you see this um, red dotted line when the OPR goes down, the interest margins for the banks are actually going up. and I guess for those who maybe depend on a lot of uh, fixed deposit um, for your savings, um, unfortunately, you may have also felt this quite meaningfully where your FD rates were just, um, they just fell off the roof. You were not able to enjoy such uh, good rates um, for your savings. And that is pretty much because the banks had to maintain a sort of spread um, between their loans and their deposits. And the first one that had to go was the fixed deposit rates. So unfortunately for us, um, we do not have that mechanism to save. But fortunately for the banks or banking stock investors, uh, we are seeing profits at least um, gaining traction to some degree. But when OPR goes back up again um, in the last few quarters, you would probably think that well, maybe they will not um, compromise on deposits, they will just quickly adjust their financing rates up first 
and maybe enjoy this um, upward spread a, a bit longer. But unfortunately, I guess it was a correction from this point because um, in December, um, I think it was quite notable that um, a lot of the banks, they did throw uh, fixed deposit rates um, to a very attractive degree. I believe some even went up to 4.8%. Um, why this happened? It was because, um, I guess it's also like this as well. We did expect the OPR to go back to 3 or maybe even 3.25%, but we expect it to happen seamlessly all the way since the first hike in May, all the way until maybe January to March 23. Unfortunately, Bank Nagara decided to take a pause for a bit. Uh, they did not raise rates in January and March. And banks um, trying to plan ahead to keep the margin spreads um, as optimal as possible. They did overestimate the fixed deposit rates that they had to pay in December, because that was mainly to account for any hikes to see in January. And we did not see that for one whole quarter. So basically what the banks were left with is um, financing rates that could not be adjusted upwards. But at the same time, they also had to feel the pain of um, paying up for more expensive deposits. So hence why we did see this downward trend um, during this period. But the good thing for the banks for now, at least, is this is likely the bottom. We are going to see rates go back up again. Um, but it does maybe paint the picture that you know perhaps the banks are also not viewed too favorably by Bank Negara in terms of profitability as well. The agenda is probably beyond corporate earnings um, at this moment. So that is something that the banks will have to manage. Uh, but again, fortunately for us, um, the worst is probably over um, because if we are expecting interest rates to remain flat going forward, it does give the banks time to adjust um, their rates back to what is deemed to be a bit more optimal. Um, so another part of um, the banking sector fundamentals is really asset quality. Um, you do let give up loans and how much you give up, there will definitely be a handful that would fail to pay going forward. And this has been a conversation that people did um, look at quite closely um, since COVID, because um, for those who maybe have been enjoying such programs, but um, there was a thing called the moratorium and also the repayment assistance programs for different payment. Uh, so some people were able to enjoy the deferred payments, but for the banks, it did pose a problem because we do not know whether the people who are deferring the payments, they will be able to service their loans once again after the program has ended. So during this time was probably where people were a bit more worried when the program started to expire. But the good thing is at least we are able to see that um, industry, uh, at least on the industry standard, it has been quite stable um, for the past few quarters. There may be a few more cracks every now and then um, because there would still be a few accounts that will default. But at least broadly speaking, we still are not in a state of concern. And that is um, relatively a good thing for the banks. So. Right, so touching on to this, which is um, the key point of this uh, discussion, timing our positions, whether do we need to look at the banking sector a bit more closely for seasonal trading, or maybe we can just buy and hold indefinitely. Um, I think for those who may have attended last year's talk as well, uh, I did present a chart to show that, you know, banks are definitely one you can just hold perpetually there is a very good chance that you would be able to at least gather positive returns in the long term. Um, although it may not be as attractive as if you were to maybe look at the more volatile sectors like technology or construction, but at least you do have stable growth in your portfolio. But what I would like to touch on first is this. So this is where I would start to elaborate on, or at least dig a bit deeper with the KL Financial Index, the Bursa Finance Index. Excuse me. So like the KLCI, um, the index is calculated in points, and this one is a bit 
it's significantly bigger. It goes in the tens of thousands. And the that's <clears throat> sorry, that's what we'll see in the blue line. And like with um, any investment study, you would have to look at valuations as well. Um, for financial stocks, the preferred is usually price to book because um, they are not deemed to usually be a very volatile sector. And it's usually a fact of um, how well managed your assets are, which is what makes your company more desirable. So price to book is usually the go-to standard um, in terms of valuations for financial stocks. So something interesting that we are seeing here, um, which might raise a few eyeballs is, although we can see that the trends or the movements um, between valuations and the last price, it does exhibit a lot of similarities in terms of its movements, but the spread is getting bigger and bigger in the sense that your index is actually gaining in price, but this comes at the cost of your valuations being even more diminished as you were in the past. 2010, um, we did stand at about 1.75 um, price to book, but right now we are only at 0 0.8 probably, or even 0 0.9. So what's going on here? Um, I think a lot, there is a mix of things um, that we can probably expect. Probably for, first of all, because there may be a growing lack of interest within the financial institution sectors, because, um, we may just be taking its safety for granted. You know, the dividend yields is definitely there. No one would dispute that. But maybe for those who have been holding banking stocks for the longest time, you would see that you know the prices sometimes just does not move. Um, CIMB, for example, it would go maybe from four ringgit to three ringgit to five ringgit, back to four ringgit and five ringgit and three ringgit and four ringgit back again. That is pretty much what I'm talking about here. Is that although as a market we do see the value come in, but people may not be necessarily giving them bigger valuations than what they had in the past. And this actually shows us that, you know, it's getting even lower and lower. But actually, if you do look at the contrary of this, if you were just to do the simple calculation of valuations being priced over your valuations, you can actually see that the price to book, sorry, the book value, which is your underlying some your underlying um, input on top of evaluations, is actually increasing and it's increasing perpetually you know, over the last year, the last many years. So the sector is definitely not going and it's definitely you know here to stay. It's one that is perpetually going to grow in terms of value. Um, and that is why, you know, in despite of us being caught in this situation of perpetually diminishing valuations, you cannot find this trend of constant growth very easily in other sectors. It's something that only the banks um, are more likely to be able to give to you. So I guess maybe looking at other companies in the past that um, people deem to be extremely high in growth, um, the first thing that probably comes to mind would be your glove companies. Top Glove, um, Kosan Hata, Supermax, they all were basically in euphoria during the COVID period. <clears throat> but when the bubble bursted, everyone just fell off. So it's that degree of sustainability that is something that banks can continue to offer. But so if we cannot look at price to book, or if we cannot look at the um, the growth of your books as a way to you know, perpetually think forward of where your price is going to be, because it has been actually quite flat um, over the many years or so, having a range bound of between uh, 12,000 to 18,000. What can we look at more closely? So, well, I'll, I'll just say it right here. Um, basically, for those who want to stay invested in the banking sector, you have to just eagle eye on the ROE of your banks. So one thing here is what we can see is ROE tends to be, uh, it, it tends to be moving ahead with regards to the valuations um, in the future. 
So what I'm saying here is we can see, um, at least from the beginning of this period for illustration purposes, um, the dip of ROE that we have seen in 2011, it came towards your valuations a bit later on. And although we did see this stabilizing um, for the next um, two years or so, ROE came off first right here before the valuations of the banks. So for those who do study financials very diligently, for those who have been able to detect any potential shifts in earnings or ROE, you might be able to notice this happening um, going forward. And well, okay, I guess a bit um, further on to this chart over here, 2016, we can start to see ROE being stable and it did translate a bit later on um, within one year. And the drop that we've seen in this part, okay, well, this is also partly due to COVID, uh, but most of the drop did come in during this period over here. So yeah, it did translate. I, I guess it, COVID did make it worse, but if not, it would probably have been lowering as well. So where are we at the moment right here? Um, banks, the valuations are, st are sitting right here at this moment. It does seem to be flat. But our ROE is, well, probably you can say it's also being flat as well. Um, well, I'm here to just say um, quite simply that um, across the banking sector, I do think it's just going to go up. So why do I say this? The banks are quite systemic to the Malaysian economy. Um, they are quite big players in the market. And 2022 was not the best year for the banks as well. You know, although we did see... Um, them benefiting from higher margins. Um, loans growth also was quite stable, quite good. But we did have to pay the most in terms of Chukai Makmo. And that is something that we're not seeing this year. So even by virtue of everything being stable and flat, when Chukai Makmo just you know, lapses this year, that itself is uh, going to be quite a good positive to your earnings in the banking sector. And also one thing that is probably a bit more tactical in nature, um, for the banks, impairments are a thing. And impairments are something that uh, the banks did try to manage a bit more carefully during COVID. Excuse me. <clears throat> so they would have this thing called um, additional provisions or overlays, which um, are basically additional buffers in case if the economy is to take a downturn a bit more severely than expected. And for those who know accounting, if you do... Um, this kind of impairments, and you do not use those impairments, you get right backs. And right backs are also something that would translate quite favorably to your PL, and hence also higher ROEs for the banks. So if you ask me, although this might not seem very encouraging for investors, I do think there is more reason to believe that at least right now, we are in a position where there is further upside to our. Um, the price, to, sorry, the valuations of our banking stocks. So seasonal trading, um, I guess, is basically a study of your ROEs. If you're able to understand or at least have a good idea where the near-term trajectory is going to be, uh, you may be able to position um, yourselves with the banks uh, uh, maybe a bit more accurately. Uh, but of course, you know, this is just a broad study. Um, timing is uh, an issue as well. Uh, it also does depend on the timing of your sale and purchase because the market is volatile. But I guess just looking at this very broadly, we can say that there is quite a good correlation with regards to how we view ROE um, and together with the overall uh, pricing of the banking sector. And I guess going back to the table that I've shown in the beginning of, in the beginning of the presentation as well, um, Basically, the downturn is right here, right? Uh, this is for the year of 23. And we did have ROE's expectations to be quite, um, what's the word for it? Quite depressed, at least from March on the way downwards. And eventually it did show as well. So uh, I guess, again, having a good sense of where you think ROE's are going to be, um, could maybe give you a good hits up um, towards uh, the position of the banks. 
Um, and I guess why ROE is also important or how we are able to incorporate it into our evaluations because we do depend on this thing called the Gordon growth model um, when we try to derive our target prices for the banking stocks. Um, here is some um, CIMB, for example, we do our evaluations, uh, we do our forecasts and our evaluations using this method. How we try to project forward is we do have to have an expectation of what the ROE for, in this case, CIMB is going to be. And this is what we would call a sustainable ROE because businesses do change, but when they do change, we expect it to remain at a certain level. So for CIMB's case, um, you know, going through this valuation method, um, we are able to come up with a price to book of about 0.92 times, um, given a book value per share of about um, 6.58, which is 2024's price to book. Uh, we do have a target price of six ringgit, but we also did give a bit of generosity to CMB Bank because we did give them an ESG premium as well. Um, ESG premium are basically for stocks that we do think are doing a bit, <coughs> excuse me, a bit better um, with regards to sustainability efforts. Um, CMB, we did give a little bit, a, a small token because um, they are one who are able to at least... <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, acquire more finan green financing shares as opposed to the other banks out there. And also, I guess, given their larger size in nature. Um, so I guess I'm just, what I'm showing here uh, ahead of time first is um, I wanted to show what the ROEs for the banks are like um, at least for one year forward. So on average, at least for the 10 banks that we have in, um, in, the Bus in Busa, Malaysia, we are expecting ROEs to at least stay at 10% for this uh, one year forward, which will be the full of 2023. And that would basically put us yeah, on the way to this trajectory. And as I mentioned, there is going to be growth going forward for us. Um, so that would just be another leg up in this case here. And it's also shown in the earnings growth that we're expecting at least at this moment. On average, we are seeing growth for both years. Um, some sectors are probably facing depression in one of the two years ahead, but the banks, at least we have some confidence that growth will somewhat be constant. Um, although there will be some that maybe have a bit of a hiccup here and there. Um, Afin, for example, um, this is really because um, they did have a very big disposal gain of the asset management arm last year. Um, the other one would be MBSB. Um, they do, they did enjoy quite a lot of um, write backs in 2022, but 2023 is probably the year that they would have to rationalize it a little bit and hence why their earnings are a bit more depressed. Um, M Bank, um, it's a bit more of a costing issue, but you can see it's just not as much as the others. Um, yeah, but essentially just to run through a little bit, uh, we do have 10 coverages, which are all the listed ones out there in the market. All, most of them actually uh, buy calls to us. Uh, Bank Islam, we think it's fairly value at this moment. Um, MBSB, not exactly a favorite, although we do think that the measure with MIDF is something that could um, be a bit more beneficial in the longer term. Uh, but I think it's a track record kind of thing. We do need to see it happen before we are able to at least instill a greater confidence to the name. So I guess on the other half of this um, conversation is if you can't, if you are not going to trade, why not just invest, invest in the banks? And I guess the good thing is, you know, dividends are relatively perpetual. Um, this is the dividends that the banks have paid during this calendar year. And if you would have helped, your positions for the year, these are roughly the yields that you would have gotten. And I think if you would have invested in the banks, uh, you would already be seeing this deposits being pocketed to your account anyway. Uh, we had always favored Maybank to be um, the dividend pick because these readings um, are usually, uh, they were usually leading in the industry. Um, but over time, you can start to notice that um, the likes of actually M uh, Alliance Bank. They are one of the smallest banks out there, but they are slowly able 
to match um, in terms of dividend yields, even for the likes of CMB Bank. Um, Hong Yong Bank, maybe they're not as generous, but at least you can, you'll know definitely that they are stable. RHB is also one that's probably growing as well. Um, but RHB does have a bit of an extra nuance that um, they do have that digital bank with boost. Um, whether it may result in higher cost spending for them, uh, we do not know. Um, it, we do need to wait and see once it gets rolled out because you know digital banks are known to blow a lot of uh, marketing in their budget. So maybe that would take a toll to their earnings and that would also depress their dividends uh, with that as well. But still, you know, 7% dividend yield, it, it really does stand out anyway. So maybe it is a bet that some people may be able to take. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of safety, you probably do not need to worry too much. I would always recommend to just go with the large cap banks, um, Maybank, CMB Bank. Uh, public, not the best, but um, they are the safest bank in the market. And no one can take that away from them. So even in terms in the in the state of the downturn, <clears throat> public bank will still be able to likely maintain its payout. Yeah. Yep. So this is really just my last section, um, really quickly. Um, so although I did mention a few hiccups within the sector uh, during this period of time. Overall, we do think there are opportunities. Um, so I guess going back to the earlier point where ROEs are picking up and we do think that will translate back to the evaluations. So it does give people a reason to maybe pay a bit more close attention to the sector still. And although we did see that recovery come in over the last few months, um, people did say that foreign investors were leaving. And now they're coming back up again because uh, they do think that emerging markets are maybe once again investable. Um, but for those who maybe are a bit too late to the game, I believe there is still opportunities out there. So we are again expected to see um, growth to still be stable. Interest margins, the worst is probably over, maybe only upside or at least flattish from now. And right backs of your COVID provisions are something that would be a surprise to your earnings. And if I were to give you some top recommendations, I would have this tree right here. Um, CIMB Bank is one of my favorites because they do have quite a lot of uh, regional arms, but the most notable among them is CIMB Niaga in Indonesia. And I'm out in a situation where um, interest rates are a bit more volatile against um, your your central banking rate. Indonesia is a different, it's quite different in the sense that even up or down, they are still seeing expansion in margins. So they have been able to optimize their uh, books in quite that degree. And that does help to contribute to the strong earnings uh, on a group level. Public bank, um, again, I like it because it's probably the safest bank out there. Uh, one thing that may have caused the selling of public bank um, over the last few months is um, due to the unfortunate passing of its uh, founder, Te Hong Piao. And they do have this issue called the grandfather rule um, imposed by Bank Negara, where essentially um, private shareholders, no one can hold more than 10%. And the Te Hong Piao estate, uh, I believe he had 24%. So, what this means for them is that eventually they would have to divest this, um, either spread it amongst the family members or find strategic shareholders. Um, because if you read through the Financial Services Act from Bank Negara, I think the most extreme measure that they can do is to force public bank to sell its stake, excuse me, to the central bank, but um, it's too extreme. And I don't think it would send a very good tone to the market. Uh, when Bank Negara does this, uh, because we do have two other banks who have to comply to this uh, grandfather rule eventually, uh, that will be Hong Kong Bank and M Bank. But uh, yeah, I, again, I do not think Bank Negara will be too pushy on this. Uh, they will probably give the T family some time to sort things out, um, whether they comply or not. Well, honestly, I'm not too sure at this moment. I don't think they're in a hurry, but any clarity in this sense it only serves an upside bias to the banks. 
Um, but whether are they going to sell to other banks? I think probably not, because even 10% of public bank is already 8 billion ringgit. And you know, I don't think Vincent Tan can even afford that much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, lastly is um, M Bank. So M Bank, um, they have not been the most stable in the last few years. Um, even during the times of COVID, they had to pay um, for they had to pay their dues for the involvement in One MDB. There's a global settlement payment of about 2.8 billion. Uh, it did shake the bank quite a bit. Uh, people did stay away from it for quite a while as well. But we are probably seeing that you know they are going back to the right track, at least comparable to pre-COVID levels. And we also know that um, M-Bank has been one of the names that has been uh, quite a common suspect with regards to consolidation or mergers with other banks. And I think right now, more than ever, probably if any talks were to happen, uh, it may come back again. And you know, if this is a bet that we're willing to take, you know, probably now M Bank could be cheap, and uh, when the consolidation does happen, maybe we could see the capital upside uh, being drastically improved because of it. But it's a bad um, if, in terms of fundamentals, it's still at least recovering back to its pre COVID levels. So, yeah, so I believe that's all I have. So, thank you so much for your attention. Um, Shane, I think we can go to QA. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Clement, for your wonderful presentation. So if you have any questions to ask our speaker, Clement, today, please write your questions at the Q&A box, not the chat box. Write them at the Q&A box. All right. So the first question on my screen is asked by Mr. Maslan. Uh, what is the difference between the digital bank and the Malaysian conventional banks like Maybank CMB and Bank Islam? Could you tell us about digital bank? Sure. Um, I guess the easiest way to wrap around it is they serve to be a branchless bank. So how does this work? So basically, if you want to sign up for a digital banking account, you just have to download the app. If you want to do um, your onboarding, you would submit your documents over your phone. Um, this would be maybe taking a photo of your IC and you know doing that uh, biometric scan of with your phone um, for facial recognition, those kind of things, which is called EKYC, electronic know your customer methods. Uh, we are actually seeing this already. Uh, I believe some of the apps out there um, are already practicing this. But basically, this is a platform. Uh, this is the platform that they're intended to use to be able to reach um, the underserved communities. Because some market, some areas, um, I, I guess the most extreme one would be like your 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 Sarawak forest reserve areas, right? You know, although you do have um, people living there, but it does not make sense for a bank to open a branch right over there. And even if they are able to build somewhere close to it, the commute is just um, quite challenging. So digital banks are here to solve that problem. But the problem with that as well is that um, because you may just be onboarding people who might already be rejected by the banks in the first place, um, it does have that higher risk of asset quality. Um, that is also one difference that um, we need to take note of with regards to digital bank. And how the banks are going to manage it, I think um, we just have to wait and see because another, another restriction that digital banks uh, do not, sorry, one of the restrictions with existing banking platforms is that um, we do need to rely on credit scoring, um, your secret score, or even like, you know, if you do know CTOS and can pay for a credit report, banks have the right to reject you if your credit score is poor. But for digital banks, they will have to depend on other methods to evaluate you. And if you, for some reason, are able to pass it, then you are eligible for a loan right away. And, you know, a lot of the rural um, kampong folks, they most likely do not have credit cards and a lot of the banking of the sorry credit score is built on credit card transactions so how do you qualify these customers using conventional banks so that's what digital banks are trying to solve yeah 
I guess that there will be definitely a much longer answer to this, but um, yeah, at but least can for the, the interest of time, banks, this is a brief version of it. Yeah. Can the digital banks Sorry? assess yeah. the credit credit uh credit worthiness of the customer based on checking the secrets and also the CTOS? So if they yeah, don't have so a credit card, point... it's very unlikely for them to get the secrets, right? Yeah, so I guess this is where the this is where you can see the structure of the digital banks are in Malaysia at this moment. Maybe let me just go to this slide um, right here. Because you do have to think of alternative methods, right? So how Grab is in this picture at the first place is because Grab has the transaction history of um, its users. So Maybe you are the kind who has always kept um, 200 ringgit in your Grab e-wallet. Maybe you are the kind of person who has always been spending in terms of um, e either the, its e-hailing platform or basically just use its services um, to some degree. Uh, but what Grab has in terms of, um, I guess the term that people like to use back then was uh, big data. Grab basically has information on your transaction histories. And knowing at least to some degree that you, um, on that example, have always um, have 200 ringgit with you in your account, you are at least deemed able to have um, that servicing ability to meet that 200 ringgit um, at any point in time. Maybe they would think that as 200 per month, and how would that translate to your overall uh, loans? Uh, we still need to wait and see. Uh, we, have, we have actually been trying to get some of these banks to speak about uh, what's their plan going forward, especially RHB and Boost because um, they are both listed um, through Axiata and uh, RHB itself. But um, understandably, they're all quite tight-lipped with regards to this. Um, but this is one method that we can use. Um, I guess even if you look across to um, the other one, which is um, C and YTL, uh, we all know C um, owns Shopee. Uh, so that is another platform to know what's the transaction history of the habits of its users. Lah. And that is something that they could use to assess uh, how much or how well a customer can be um, to ha have a borrowing facility. All right, I see. So how, how is the possible margins like for all these digital banks? Uh, I think it's going to be even thinner compared to the banks. <laughs> so why I say this is because um, well, com traditional, traditionally, um, banks would have to take deposits which are low, which they would try to give as low interest as possible, and they would mark it up with um, loans that are higher um, by a few levels ahead. When you are new um, as a digital bank or even any, any player in the market, how do you attract new depositors? You have to raise, you have to give um, higher than industry deposit rates. But how do you gain um, borrowers? That's by offering lower than market um, financing rates. So that double whammy itself is going to kill your margin for, uh, right off the bat. So I guess they could try to give a premium um, just for the sake of um, giving access uh, to financing. But on the offshoot, the first few years is definitely going to be a very problematic one. And I believe um, someone was able to study across the global markets, but I think only five out of um, 30 digital banks were, were able to break even. Um, but that's also within the span of five years. So how are we going to perform? I guess we just have to say good luck to them. <laughs> yeah. But it's definitely interesting to see like, because um, the normal banks, they would definitely not try to give up market share as much as possible because they are still competitors. Like. Uh, you do not want them to grow too big. Uh, it's a dog in dog world. But yeah, basically tough. Like. It's very tough. Mm, yeah, the next follow-up question for Wong is that do you think consumers can apply mortgage or higher purchase loan from digital banks? So 
Um, I believe if you study across um, the global digital banks um, like Orange in Europe um, and even some of the American ones, they do not start with very high ticket item um, financing. Most of them actually did start in the form of buy now, pay later, um, like what we're seeing now, which is essentially 0% um, financing. Um, I think even if you're given a ticket size, the most that maybe you are able to give is maybe about 10,000 because the it, this comes again to the risk of the higher risk that you are taking um, by lending to customers without proper credit scoring. Uh, I may just, you know, try to create a fake account. Um, maybe just try to apply for the maximum loan available like 10,000 and I just disappear right after I get the money. That can happen. It's very possible. And I think it's one that, um, you know, the banks, the digital banks will be very wary of. So maybe in the offshoot, <clears throat> what they would try to do is um, also what Bank Negara wants them to do uh, is to just give microfinancing. So microfinancing is like, um, it's really meant to help like your micro SMEs. For example, if um, there's a chick in the kampung who wants to buy a new sewing machine to um, do a small sewing business, but she needs a financing to buy that sewing machine, which is maybe a few hundred, maybe a thousand ringgit. She can get financing for that. And hopefully she will be able to repay. Um, but that's the skill um, of um, financial enablement that uh, we are trying to get from digital banks, at least at the very first place. Maybe three years down the road, we may only have two or three uh, digital banks left, or maybe just even one. Maybe that is when we might be able to see that uh, they might start to explore to uh, mortgages. But until then, uh, no, we, we, it's unlikely that we will see such big ticket items for digital banks. Mm, okay, I understand that. Now, Clement, we know that uh, Ringgit Malaysia has underperformed against the basket of currencies in this year. So the next question by Patrick is, how will the weakening mm. uh, ringgit impacts the bank's valuation? Oh, actually, this is quite an interesting topic because um, it doesn't really have so much to do with um, the banking valuations, actually. Um, but the weakening ringgit, or I should say the volatility of ringgit is actually a benefit to the bank to the banks uh, mostly as a whole. Why do I say this is because um, banks, they do have treasury departments um, who are involved in the trading of Forexes, Forex, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So when foreigners come in and come out of the country or even for exports uh, in general, any transactions that you do in foreign currency, you would need to do it through your banking facility and they would scrap the spread for you. and I guess with Ringgit being weak, uh, it does make foreign exchange transactions a bit more active. So if you do look across the board for the banks, it is quite strange to actually see that this is where they are actually benefiting in the current climate. Um, they are earning a little bit more compared to previous years because of this. Um, which, you know, although we do normally ascribe a weaker ringgit to be an unfortunate thing, but uh, at least the banks right now, they are able to, you know, gain higher earnings because of this. So um, I guess going back to the key discussion earlier, if we do see higher earnings, that would mean higher ROE. Um, although maybe it will not be sustainable because the volatilities uh, may not be as strong in the future. But um, at least for the time being, it is something that can help to support uh, ROEs. Uh, so that may also help to improve the price to book yeah, for the banks. Thanks, Clement, uh, for answering the question. Now, Clement, we saw that uh, earlier you gave three banks 5% ESG premium. Can you comment about that? Uh, are the other banks doing poorly on their ESG sure. that don't deserve the premium? Right, so um, it's really our effort to instill um, ESG mechanisms into our valuations. 
um, it's not to say the other banks are performing poorly. Um, in fact, the spectrum that we have is um, you either get um, no adjustments, um, you either get a 5% premium or you get a 5% discount. What we try to do is um, to create a bell curve of sorts. Um, it, it's a bit arbitrary, I will have to admit, but we want to at least highlight any bank who may be doing better than others um, in certain ESG uh, elements. So it's not to say that anyone is doing poorly um, because one of the complicated things with this is um, you know, ESG, the three components being environment, social, and governance, right? Governance, the banks are highly compliant to Bank Agara. Social, maybe we look at CSR, the corporate social responsibility measures that the banks would use. But at the same time, you know, the larger you are, the more resourceful, the more resources you would have to do more ESG, uh, ES, sorry, uh, CSR um, activities. Um, Maybank is definitely able to do more charity than the likes of Affin or Alliance Bank. Um, so in that sense, we cannot um, punish um, Alliance Bank for not being as generous as, um, you know, uh, Maybank with regards to CSR. But what we try to look at is where the banks stand with regards to enabling uh, more sustainable financing. Sustainable financing would be uh, green financing, um, which is um, the, the very basic one would be just solar panels and EVs, EV financing. Um, but a bit more nuanced would be um, sustainable uh, development projects uh, because you know, there are a few uh, project financing um, requirements that uh, may require certain projects to maybe move towards uh, more sustainable uh, uh, development methods. Maybe it's like um, moving from coal-powered uh, coal sources to small green-powered sources or maybe just using recyclable materials, those kind of things. That is something that we think is more measurable for the banking space at this moment. So the three banks um, of CIMB, Public Bank and Alliance Bank, the premium that we've given to them is really due to their efforts um, relative to the others in this space. CIMB Bank um, is thanks to regional. Um, public Bank, surprisingly, uh, they are actually quite leading in terms of their energy efficient vehicle financing. Alliance Bank, um, although they are one of the smallest bank, we do think they deserve that 5% reward because with regards to loans evaluation um, for the assessment of um, carbon, footprint, um, they are actually one of the first few to adopt, um, I, I guess, global standards. Uh, not to say that the other banks um, are not doing it, but at least they are the first one who we have been able to identify to be doing it very publicly. So um, maybe the other banks are just not comfortable enough to want to promote this, but we do note that Alliance Bank, at least on the surface, is one of the leading uh, with this regard. So it's not, uh, again, it's not to say that any banks are doing poorly. Uh, we just want to highlight the banks who are taking one step uh, ahead to try to drive um, sustainability efforts. So, so hence why we have a 5% ESG premium on them. Thanks for the clarification. Now talking about sustainability, the next question by Stephen is, uh, is May Bank high dividend yield sustainable? Right, so, I believe it is. Um, the, the good or bad thing about Maybank is um, for those who have the stock, I think you would probably know that the share price hardly goes anywhere. So uh, I guess jokingly, what we like to tell our clients as well is that it's basically your liquid FD. You can go in and put your money in Maybank and you can withdraw it at any time and you, know, you would still be able to come back and enjoy that same yield. But that being said, um, Maybank is definitely still working very hard to grow. The challenge that they have um, being the largest bank in Malaysia is that um, you may already be oversaturated. But that's not a problem with Maybank because um, they are at least able to move in line with the market. So if the market is, um, if the whole industry is growing like 4 to 5%, 
Maybank will be there. And with any growth, um, you know, that does translate to your dividends and hence um, your dividend yields would be intact as well. But this does come back to the earlier discussion, isn't it, that um, you know, the valuation of the banking sector is perpetually eroding. So although you may be getting more dividends um, this year relative to last year, but your share price may just remain stagnant. But that, you know, for Maybank may still be okay because you are still being rewarded with about seven to eight percent dividend yield. So that's excuse me, that's uh, that's you know not really a bad thing, I would say. All right. Thanks so much, uh Clement. Um, we have one uh, attendees who comment that you know, the digital initiative or investment in the public bank is relatively behind other banks. So what will be the impact for public bank going forward on poorer digitalization? So um, this is something that um, I think it's quite known in the investment community as well. Um, Call it, call it being a Chinaman company. Um, uh, but everyone is aware um, that with regards to at least uh, moving forward, public bank is a bit lagging in that sense. Um, but that is not why people invest um, in public bank. Um, maybe it's because of um, being stuck with the old tried and true methods, which is why public bank is able to do so well. They are actually the leading bank in terms of um, mortgage share, by the way. And people still do prefer to do business with public bank. So maybe you could say it's the uh, more traditional folk who still prefer to do things um, physically. Uh, but it does not take away the fact that public bank, um, they are the second largest um, domestically. It does not take away the fact that they do have one of the best um, cost management. Maybe you could you you could also say that it's because of the lack of investments that's why the cost is also low. But as a business, uh, you cannot you cannot discount that applying to their efficiency. And maybe in fact, I should just go to this slide over here. Right. So, um, public bank being the second last stock in this line, ROE is thirteen percent. It's actually the highest amongst everybody else. So yeah, yeah I think that's all we need to say. Yeah, it, it's, not, it's not an indication that public bank is doing poorly. People do appreciate it, appreciate it for, the, for the value it brings. Um, it may not be as sexy as um, some of the other ones like CMB Bank, but as an investment, it's still a very sound one. And that is something that people will continue to pay attention in. All right, thanks for uh, the clarification. Um, now, we know that MBSB has done an acquisition in the past recently. Um, so the next question by Sinapan is that, will there be any other mergers of banks take place in the future? So the normal answer that they would give if, is, is if there is any mergers that make the due announcements. So at this moment, I, can, I, I cannot say that there is any or whether there are any discussions going on um, for any future in, uh, mergers. But I would just go back to my point on MBank that, you know, in the past, they have always been one of the darlings with regards to m and um, Why M-Bank specifically? Um, okay, I think this is also a good table that we can refer to. So M-Bank, um, you can see, well, in terms of its market cap, um, 12 billion, right? So what? where does this put them? It puts them at maybe number six um, out of the 10 out here um, within the list. Who would benefit from acquiring a number six bank. Definitely, uh, I don't think it would be Hong Leung Bank because um, even if they were to acquire M Bank, it would not help them to move close to um, their next closest competitor, which is uh, CMB. Um, it could be RHB Bank uh, because it may bring them closer to Hong Leung Bank. 
but we need to identify as well uh, why do people even want to acquire MBank at the first place. Um, they do have strong SME um, portfolios. Um, this one we definitely have to agree on. They do have um, a strong, a, a semi-strong presence in certain area in terms of the retail market. Um, it may also just be a discussion that maybe someone may just try to acquire certain divisions within a bank. Uh, that could also be something that we could think about. Um, you know, in the last few years as well, you have probably seen um, banks just letting go certain divisions like Afin. They let go of the asset management arm. Um, M Bank um, and Alfin also. They just they let go of their insurance arm. Alliance Bank did let go of stockbroking. So mergers does not need to account uh, as a whole organization. It can also come in the form of just business units, um, and that is also one thing that. Uh, did lead the discussion for MBSB to buy MITF because MBSB is a sole conventional bank, MITF is a sole investment bank. Put those two together, you get a full-fledged bank. And that is um, that is essentially the direction that the management was going for. Mm, so yeah, maybe it could be a bit difficult to say um, whether a bank and a bank could shake hands again together, but we may also just you know have to dial it back down a bit again to maybe consider that it's just business units that we could be talking about here. All right. Um, let's do one last question. So do you think that there will be any further uh, net interest margin compression should Bank Nagara raises the OPR again? I hope not. <laughs> but uh, at least for now, our view is there is no reason for Bank Nagara to want to raise OPR again. Oh, let's just go through that slide. So you can see from here that, you know, historically speaking, even the highest rate that um, Bank Nagara did keep OPR is about 3.25%. And that is where inflation was creeping at maybe around, yeah, within the 3 to 4% level. And I think that was where the worry was in the last few quarters because we did see inflation come to this level. If it did not improve, then Bank Nagara would probably have to go up one more leg. But if not, I mean, if we were to at least stay at where we are right now, 2%. Uh, I think it, historical the historical numbers will speak for itself. Um, at the point of um, 3% OPR, we had you know, relatively maintained within this level. It's nowhere near um, where some of the higher inflation readings were at. And, you know, it's, it's also something that they need to be very careful about because uh, OPR is a cost to your community. Um, and for us who are having mortgages, uh, we, we do feel the pinch every time there's an interest rate hike. And, you know, who's to say um, businesses or even um, some of the not so well to do might also feel it as well. It, it's definitely a toll to the economy. Um, but it is a tool to control inflation. And as long as inflation um, is within control, I do not expect the OPR to go any further. So maybe if we do see inflation come off a bit more um, in the next quarter, maybe there is a chance that um, Bank Nagara may think that they have overdone on the OPR and maybe they might even reduce it. Uh, but given the signals that we have right now, I think we are just probably going to stay at 3%, at least for the rest of this year. All right. Thank you so much, Clement, for doing this uh, segment for us, which is uh, help us help, helping us to gain insights into the banking sector. So I hope that you all have gained enormous value learning uh, from the research done by Clement. Right. Thanks, everyone, for your time. All right. So I've just taken the uh, screen sharing control. So for those of you who haven't had a CanTrade account yet, you may fill up an online uh, opening form, which I've just given you in the chat box. So that's where 
you can open a can trade trading account. So if you want to get some trading ideas from Kenanga, you may join the Kenanga Trade to Win Telegram channel. So on their Trade to Win Telegram channel, they give trade ideas on how you can trade the market. And for can trade app, right? Uh, we have upgraded to can trade 2.0. So if you haven't downloaded can trade 2.0, you may go to App Store or Google Play uh, to download the latest can trade 2.0 with enhanced features on how you can trade the market. All right. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, you just heard from the senior equity analyst from Kananga Investment Bank, Mr. Clement Chua on the banking sector outlook. So thank you everybody for staying tuned until the end of this webinar. And thank you Clement for sharing with you with us our uh, your research on banking sector. Thank you everybody. Stay safe. All right. Bye everybody.